It's a pleasure and an honor to be here at Göttingen University, and I would like to thank my hosts at the Centrale Custodie, and in particular, uh, Marie-Louise Allemeyer for her generous introduction, um, which makes me sound like I must be 102 years old, but <laughs> in fact, it is in this oscillation between disciplines that uh, collections exist, and that is the great strength uh, also of the Forum Wissens project. Um, and those collections are much older than 102. So uh, it's great to have the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, I would also like to note that some of the research for this paper was effected at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin. So even if I will speak in English and mainly about British museum science, German scholarship and friendship are at the heart of what I will say today. I'm going to be speaking about uh, two case studies, one in the 17th century and one in the 21st century, and I will oscillate between these two poles. I will also oscillate between the poles of manuscript and database catalogs, and the collection management processes that they engender and that are correlative with them. So this is the axis of oscillation in which I will be uh, speaking. So I will speak about taxonomy in the early modern period around 1680, and I will also be speaking about contemporary natural history museums as laboratories. Both are intimately related because periodicity is certainly not the only prerequisite for epistemology. And I'm glad to say that increasingly, I'm not the only person who is interested in putting early modern and postmodern side by side. I will be looking at the Natural History Museum of London as a case study for what a specimen collection, and in particular its management, might be able to tell us about similarities, differences and developments in practices between early modern natural history and post-genomic natural history. Museum practice and collection management is an extremely complex and fundamental aspect of natural history, and one that is often hidden, so obvious as to be overlooked. As Bruno Strasser has remarked, he mentions that it is assumed to have been superseded by the experimentalization of biology. But in recent studies of early modern paper tools, such as catalogs, and in studies of contemporary data-driven science, practices of curation and information management related to collections are increasingly evoked and explored together. In particular, I'm thinking of the work of uh, Staffan Müllerwilli, who I believe has also spoken from this very podium, and Isabelle Charmentier on the information practices of Carl Linnaeus. But I'm also thinking of the context of paper tools from which Linnaeus's practices emerged and to which he in turn contributed. There is also the work of Anke de Hiesen on the boxes and field notes of Messerschmitt in Siberia in the 18th century, and recent research and publications on early museum inventories and manuscript catalogs from a range of periodicals and locales. They have recently appeared, for example, in the Journal of the History of Collections. This kind of work in the history of collections has a contemporary counterpoint in Jeff Boker's book, Memory Practices of the Sciences, and in Bruno Strassel's recent paper, which was entitled Data-Driven Sciences from Wonder Cabinet to Electronic Database. Clearly, it's becoming of greater importance to look very closely at collection management practice itself and how it developed in relation to the life sciences over time. Those who have read the now canonical article by James Greisimer and Susan Lee Starr, 
which was a social study of the origins of the University of California, Berkeley's Museum of Vertebrate Zoology, an article published in 1989, will know how complex natural history practice is and that it connects a very mobile and mutable natural world to a world of highly organized data and collections management. I'm not so interested myself in Greisimer and Starr, uh, their aspects of social or nat uh, actor network theory in relation to natural history, even inside the museum, though the museum is certainly itself quite an actor network study to be made. What interests me is the idea of a collection as a vast instrument in itself. The technologies of which are essentially those of information management and the phenomenal cognitive experience of the curators who produce knowledge from inside this management structure. Greisimer and Starr quote one zoologist as saying, without a label, a specimen is just dead meat. This label, its complexity, how it is constructed, how it is maintained through museum collection management, and how this process itself is maintained, how it influences understandings of the very specimens themselves is what we will be looking at this evening. So by collection management, I mean cataloging, collating, care, display, analysis, and handling of already collected specimens. More specifically, I'm interested in how the firm indexical link or rapport is maintained, or sometimes indeed lost, between the physical objects, which are specimens, and their surrogates as the more mobile data which is generated from their study, from the study of these specimens, as well as the actual conditions for the so-called tacit or embodied knowledge that is generated from working physically with the specimens themselves. This is in some senses a field report from a participant observer, as it were, rather than from an actual scientist. For two years, from 2009 to 2011, I was seconded into the Natural History Museum of London in order to assist the museum in setting up a center for arts and humanities research inside the Natural History Museum, which you will know as essentially the United Kingdom's science infrastructure for taxonomics and systematics. Though the general public sees a working visitor attraction out the front, there are, of course, as many of you will know, 300 scientists working as curators, as researchers, as lab technicians, as bioinformaticians, database managers, and more. The collections themselves are composed of ongoing acquisitions and are also discrete collections in and of themselves, some of which are several hundreds of years old. The foundation collections are those of Sir Hans Sloan, the great polymathic collector, born in 1660, before the kings. Among other things, Sloan was editor of Philosophical Transactions, president of the Royal Society, and his bequest to the nation at his death in 1753 formed the British Museum, of which the Natural History Museum is technically a part. Indeed, I spent my two years inside the NHM gravitating between its historical collections and its working 21st century laboratories. And this oscillation forms much of what I will have to tell you this evening. I'm going to begin in the present and give you an overview, for those who do not know, of current museum and collection management practice in natural history. This will be an orientation for the two case studies of collection management practice that I will present in this paper. As I mentioned, one from the 17th century concerning Sloan's collection of great significance for the epistemology of enlightenment life sciences, and the other, a case study from the 21st century digital and genomic age. I'm also going to try and connect these two across the gulf 
from 17th to 21st century, because as Bruno Strasser makes clear in the article to which I've just referred, and I quote, natural history has been data-driven for many centuries before the proponents of post-genomics approaches and systems biology began to claim the radical novelty of their methods. Many of what are claimed as novel features of contemporary data-driven sciences have parallels among earlier natural history practices. But of course, for much of its long history, from the early modern period to the advent of molecular and genetic biotechnologies in the 1970s, taxonomy and systematics were focused on the close visual observation of the natural world, differentiating between species through careful morphological examination. So what happens in a natural history museum? Let's begin with the arrival of hard-won specimens and the data which accompanies them into the museum itself. The kinds of information that will be collected in the field uh, will include things like uh, environmental conditions, the, uh, potentially the age and certainly the sex of the specimen, the date and the time of day and environmental conditions, breeding conditions that year if possible, uh, the collector's name and contact in case it's required to be in contact with them again, uh, geolocations, for example, with great precision in order to ensure that you know what the uh, distribution across a potential range of the specimen uh, might be. But then the specimen, which actually vouches for the information that is attached to it, is given an exact determination of species at a place within the taxonomic order, a location within the museum collection itself, a kind of imprimatur. Then the curatorial process begins to kick in and manage the uh, linking to the specimen itself of all the information that already accompanies the collected specimen and all the information that can be garnered in the wider world about that specimen. It's done effectively through what is now, this linking is done through what is essentially now a computerized catalog that ultimately also in turn feeds into larger online databases in the taxonomic communities of the various species. Then the huge instrument of the well-equipped Natural History Museum begins to analyze the specimen, morphologically in terms of metrics and anatomy, as well as genetically, atomically, and more. All this information must be managed by the curators and accrued to catalog databases and entries for each specimen. Much of this activity, of course, is related to securing a stable name for each species and a position for it within a consensually agreed taxonomic system, which is affected by explicitly linking a type specimen to a descriptor and to an agreed name. It is the responsibility of museum curators to maintain the deep historical link, often hundreds of years into the past, between the current agreed name of species, their original published descriptions, and the specimens from which those names were generated. This is history, but not as researchers in the humanities know it. You will have noticed, of course, how just how much information is involved here, and by association, how many techniques and their attendant epistemologies are subsumed within this list. Yet all this data comes in a range of different formats. Each of these formats requires a specific and different storage and retrieval mechanism, and many formats change over time. The tardier the scientific community is in migrating this kind of information to digitally accessible formats, the less valuable to these scientists the specimens themselves actually become. When most of the history of natural history is in analog formats, 
Field notes, films, photographs, diaries, drawings, the log books of ships, correspondence, and more. And yet the practice of natural history is, as with all life sciences in the present day, a digital one. The value of the information retained but not digitally accessible is lost, and the specimens themselves move into a marginal position, excluded often from analysis at exactly the moment when a long view of environmental change is most crucial. Digitization is not in itself an answer necessarily, either pragmatically or in relation to the way in which it manages to obscure the specificities of the different knowledge regimes and practices from which the information originates originally and initially. What kind of database could ever hope to effectively handle this vast quantity and range of information? And what kinds of epistemological problems are presented by this data management? What happens to the actual specimen from which all this data is generated and to which it must be attached by collections management processes? For the curator of natural history, the care of the collections extends to maintaining the absolutely critical location of each specimen in relation to other specimens within an intellectual conceptual structure of speciation, which also has a direct correlative in a spatial disposition at the museum itself. That is to say that each carefully localized specimen in each drawer, in each cabinet, in each department, on each floor of the building is treated as if it were a precise location on a branch of the so-called tree of life. The building itself is in effect constructed, used, and understood as a three-dimensional diagram of life on earth made up of the very matter of life itself. Thus, rather as the periodic table of the elements is both a diagram and an instrument for investigation into the lacunae that it defines, the Natural History Museum is itself a vast instrument for the practice of taxonomy, and the spaces left in specimen drawers are created expressly with an understanding of where those species lacunae might fit in. In such a museum, there are also a series of laboratories in order to affect the kinds of analyses that lead to correct determination of species and of their environments, molecular biology for genomically sequencing samples of specimens. Also, there are microbiology labs for analyzing habitats and microscale species an analytical and imaging laboratory with equipment for spectrometry, chromatography, X-ray diffraction, scanning electron microscopy, CT scanners, and more, as one would expect in a practice that encompasses the life sciences, chemistry, and physics. So now to the question of the collection database. The following slides were created by David Smith, who is the curator of mineralogy at the Natural History Museum in London. In these screen grabs, David Smith cycles through a series of frames, each of which contains specific fields of data. They do not all relate to the same specimen, but they do give a sense of the magnitude of the scale, both in volume and in historical reach, of the information that is being handled by these databases and the complexity of the interrelations between the data sets themselves. So this frame, for example, gives information about a type specimen, one that is held specifically because it is the first instance where an accurate description of the species was created such that it was possible to affix a binomial identifier to it. You will note that it refers to a description made by Neville Story Maskelyne in 1864 in a journal savant. That description has not yet been digitized, and there is no reference, for example, to the instrumentation 
or the conditions in which the descriptive determination was made some 150 years ago. That technical practice, that embodied knowledge is subsumed in, and assumed to be known inside the way that the database uh, retains the information that was extracted, but not the practices that produce that information. So taxonomy has uh, as many screens, for example, as are needed based on the ventilation of taxonomic classification, both past and present, so as to be able to show the links between classifications that have changed over time. Here, for example, uh, weights and measures are recorded and other under age data, uh, the ability to notate time in different agreed standardized formats. For example, mineralization age, host rock age, isotopic age, all of which are different formats of uh, of time record of uh, time identification for the uh, for the specimen, and what these different time formats actually mean, how they have been consensually agreed by scientists, and how they have layered over each other over centuries is not problematized in any way. They are uniquely there in order to correlate different deep time understandings from different periods of earth science praxis over several centuries. In a set of succinct and incisive observations, which are themselves based in part on natural history databases, Jeff Boker, whose book Memory Practices in the Sciences I showed you earlier, reminds us, and I quote, any data coding scheme contains traces of its own past. This is frequently buried deep enough that it might not be apparent to a contemporary user, and that an archeological effort is required in order to uncover deep-rooted biases. Any given model of a given biogeographic region at some previous geological epoch might be drawing on a large number of models and data sets, each with their own relatively recondite legacies. It is precisely this kind of museum database that is harvested for systematics, as if the database were a transparent given to anchor more complex modeling project, projects in contemporary biodiversity and ecology. These are built on these databases that have subsumed the praxis in which they have been produced. So for example, the KEMU database at the Natural History Museum is therefore itself a subject for study, including the way in which it feeds its data into larger scale international databases, many of which are online, and in which context the specific conditions of production of that data, of that knowledge, become both submerged and leveled. The NHM collection management database holds all the information required in order to affect research into the material and instrumental conditions in which determinations of each species have been made over time. We could employ it as a way of cracking open the modeling practices, statistical and otherwise, at the heart of the conceptual link between taxonomy and systematics, for example, which is itself essentially a representational structure, both enabling of and enabled by classification. If we were to use these collection databases in this way, how far back could we go? Well, at the NHM in London, we could certainly go as far back as the collections go themselves, as far back as 1680. This is a detailed view of the special collections area in the London Natural History Museum, which houses the herbarium of Sir Hans Sloan, whose collections amassed between 1680 and 1753 were essentially bequeathed to the nation at his death. These collections and the state's acquisition of them were the impetus 
for the founding of the British Museum in 1753, and they are therefore the founding collections of the three institutions which have gradually, over 300 years, been split into the British Library, the British Museum, and the Natural History Museum. The Sloan Herbarium contains 265 bound volumes, enclosing some 120,000 sheet-mounted specimens, which came to Sloan via at least 300 known named correspondence. There is also, as part of this extraordinary survival from the early modern period, a vegetable substances collection of about 12,000 specimens, some of which we will look at more closely in a minute. These numbers represent solely the botanical specimens in what was an encyclopedic collection extending far beyond natural history alone. This slide lists the scale of the surviving collection alone, and even the survivals are daunting. With this overview here, I'm also attempting to give you a sense of the voraciousness, the scale of collecting, and of data management in which Sloan was involved. This is huge data, not only for Sloan's time, but also for the NHM in the present day, and for any future project which proposes to analyze or reconstruct Sloan's wide-ranging collections. But to go beyond the numbers and into the implications of this collection, it is important to have a sense of the worlds in which Sloan moved and for which he was a significant figure. He was the only person ever to have been concurrently president of the Royal Society and president of the College of Physicians. He edited the Philosophical Transactions over two decades, and he also acted as secretary to the Royal Society, which means that he was closely involved in publications beyond Phil Trans, he was also involved in demonstrations and experiments conducted at the Society during this formative period, both under Newton's presidency and, of course, under his own presidency, which followed Newton directly. This image displays a very small selection of Sloan's boxed collection of 12,000 vegetable substances, seeds and their pods, fruit stones, beets, beans, roots, resins, worked materials, and more. Many of their containers are original period constructions with attendant annotation on the very box. This is data two. Sloan's vegetable substances collections are in part what would come to be known as economic botany, and it contains also much materia medica as would be expected from the fact that Sloan was a practicing physician. Some may have read the article, What's in the Box? by James Del Borgo in issue 41 of Cabinet Magazine concerning this collection. It also figured this collection in Anka Tahizan's incisive and enlightening article, Accounting for the Natural World, Double Entry Bookkeeping in the Field, which appeared in 2004. Tahizan's paper concerns, in the main, the field collections and management practices of Daniel Gottlieb Messerschmidt in his seven-year expedition to Siberia for Peter the Great in 1720 to 1727. It shows a clear set of origins and epistemologies, her article, for the collection management of natural history collections of that period. But of course, Sloan had already been collecting and collating for at least 35 years by the time Messerschmitt set out for Siberia. In the comparison that Tahizan draws between them, however, it is a posit. Both men engaged, she says, in a parallel ordering practice involving writing and objects in relation both to mercantile bookkeeping and to the learned notation system of excerpting. The accounting traditions of number and letter that they both deployed were closely intertwined. The survivals of Sloan's collections, his catalogs, and his collection management 
can tell us much about the emergence of a natural history practice that Messerschmitt in his time had known as something more systematic and more standardized. I concur with Tehisen's highly original work on Messerschmitt. His accounting of his accounts offers crucial insight into all that came before, including Sloan. These are threads to wind back farther. So let's look closely at this one specimen, if we wind back farther. It is a cocoon bean from the Caribbean. Sloan's collecting impulse, already in evidence from an early age, came, became focused under the direction of the great botanist John Ray, who instructed Sloan, as Sloan set out in 1687, at the age of 27, for the island of Jamaica where he was to stay as the physician to the Duke of Albemarle until the Duke's death a year later and Sloane's eventual return to England in 1689 with his collections. This page of Sloane's catalog of his vegetable substances in his own hand has also his own commentary. Each item was entered chronologically in order of acquisition but this is not just a list. Each, each item is accorded a descriptor. With Sloan's cataloging, we are witnessing the emergence of indexical practices in relation to natural materials. This activity that is a prerequisite for the kind of classification that Messerschmitt was able to effect. But we are also witnessing one of the sites of the emergence of morphological taxonomy and concurrently the tip of the iceberg of tacit knowledge, of embodied knowledge. For example, Sloan is at pains here to differentiate specimens by their variations in shape when he makes his descriptors. So for example, uh, there are six identical, but not perfectly identical, uh, specimens he describes the same oblong and thick, the same as it were angular, the same compressed or fat. So these are morphological observations before morphology. Morphology is a quintessentially observational activity. Morphological descriptors need to be precise and concise and indexically linked to the individual specimens in order to be able to circulate as texts and images to those who cannot see the specimens themselves. The entire scaffolding of early modern representational practices in natural history, incorporating manuscript descriptors in catalogs and in correspondence, in published catalogs and including scientific visualizations, both unique and multiply reproduced through engraving, is obliged by the comparative difficulty of traveling for those collecting and studying this material and the difficulty of obtaining, maintaining, and sharing actual unique specimens. But it is my belief that it is not only the specimens and their surrogates that traveled around the world through epistolary and also personal travel routes. It is also the collection management practices that traveled from place to place. If we are able to trace the circulation and the adoption uh, of this panoply of practices as well, we might be able to see how they leveraged and triangulated with the sensory experiences that, through what we have called tacit knowledge, created cognitive leaps, leaps in understanding in natural history. Tracing the adoption of different collection management techniques might well be able to help us reconstruct precisely what actions of manipulation of which materials in, natural, in the natural world produced what kinds of knowledge. Sloan's catalogs are the place where the specimen description, that first surrogate, is lifted from the object and concurrently linked to it numerically making it possible for the specimen to be mobile in a room 
to be arranged and rearranged alongside other morphologically related specimens, as well as to enable it to be both preserved in a drawer and quickly retrieved. Cataloging practices would have been central to experimental juxtaposition of specimens, classification and reclassification, and hence to knowledge production. The degree of indexical hypertextuality clustering around this little handful of beans with different shapes is actually rather impressive. For example, with the specimen 365, we see a reference in pencil to Linnaeus's Flora Zeelandica of 1747, a reference which was annotated possibly 50 years after the original catalog entry and could easily be in Sloane's own later hand. So he is re-annotating over a 50-year period to indexically garner and gather information about this specimen over a very long period of time. It will come as no surprise to librarians or indeed museum professionals that the manuscripts, books, and albums contained in Sloane's working collections would have been recatalogued from a very early age after the instatement of the British Museum, following Sloane's will and the acquisition of his collections for the nation. The materials were first recatalogued by Ace Cuff, which is the catalog you see here, published in 1782, and then again they were later indexed in 1902 by Scott. It's important to note that this late 18th and very early 20th century cataloging and recataloging does not mean that the catalogs created by more modern staff are necessarily better, more comprehensive, or more coherently indexed. Simply, they represent the interests of their time as well as the catalogs of Sloan do of his time. We can show here in high relief the intellectual and indeed memory practices of each period by their catalog. Using a range of historical bibliography tools and techniques from literary studies, for example, these catalogs can be approached as historically bound texts through which to trace the emergence and formulation and reformulation of entire disciplines within both the sciences and the humanities, in Sloane's case. Close reading of consecutive catalogues of the same materials can tell us much about evolving practice and can place catalogues themselves at the center of historiographic practice. Of particular interest here, for example, is the fact that Aescuff lists museum catalogues under the same heading as natural history. A clear indication that in the later 18th century, the close link between collection management and natural historical investigation is not something so transparent as to have become invisible. Together, they still form cutting edge practice at the time. But the language of images is also one with which Sloan was conversant. And here we leap over to what remains of Sloane's collections within the British Museum Prints and Drawings Department. Sloane's collections of albums, bound volumes of images, both unique and printed, complement the material and organic collections in a number of instances. And they appear to have uh, stood in as surrogates for the absent specimens that he was not able to obtain. This image shows us the sort of visual referential context in which our cocoon bean and its catalog entry would have been operative for Sloan. So there, is, there are the actual cocoon beans and then there are these images of other kinds of beans and seeds. It's not insignificant that the image, this one, created by one of the greatest natural history, natural history artists of the time, Nicolas Robert, organizes the specimens in a grid. It is a grid that begs, or perhaps more precisely enables, comparison 
between specimens. Comparison not simply between the seeds which were imaged in the confines of the page, but also by extension to all those actual specimens that could be physically clustered around the image on a table. This is one of the few remaining original drawers surviving from the period in which Sloan was managing his own collections. It too is organized in a grid, albeit one which privileges concentricity rather than an organization along two uh, parallel axes, perpendicular axes. It is redolent of a materia medica practice rather than of a natural historical collection and it exists as it does as early furnishing inside a collection with one of the longest traceable developments from the 1680s to the 1750s. Therefore, it offers us important clues to this elusive history of the development between apothecaries and medical botanists and natural history practice as something that took place in the everyday professional lives of uh, apothecaries. So in the crosshairs between the history of museums and the history of natural history, we have seen some close attention paid to the architecture of entire buildings, for example, or the layout of individual rooms, of cabinets, of studioli, of display vitrines, and of the boxes which enable specimens to move from one place to another. But to my knowledge, we have not really looked at the circulation of information about these technologies, nor does there appear to have been a close look at the use and function of the most prosaic building block, which is the compartmented specimen drawer. These shallow receptacles, divided into equal sections, or more than just a place to keep and conserve, of course, they enable comparison and juxtaposition. Building upon and working back in time from Tihizen's work on Messerschmitt's boxes and Müller-Willi's work on Linnaeus's herbarium cabinets, we can look more closely at this simple furnishing as a site not just of preordained classification or simply the preservation of specimens, but actually as a site of experiment. Between the chronological linearity of an acquisition list in the catalogues and the synoptic nature of an eventual classificatory declination, there must lie an extended period of an ephemeral lived practice of organizing and managing both specimens and knowledge in tandem and in counterpoint. It's a kinetic, active, physical practice of handling and moving specimens around and juxtaposing them in some explicatory, cognitive or comparative and structured way. It must have been either induced or enabled by some kind of delineated set of related receptacles. The grid of the pharmacopoeia already a tool well known to apothecaries and other medical practitioners like Sloan, would be just such a tool. It would be known to them, it would be ready to hand, and it would be a reasonable transference, quite literally, in fact, from one practice to another, from one set of materials to another, apothecary, natural historical. But these grids, these specimen drawers share another equally transparent and therefore invisible tool, which is the table, which is also in conjunction with the mobile trays necessary to practices which are more juxtapositionally experimental. So the Nicolas Robert image, the trays of seeds, moving all of these things around on a table, In some cases, the specimen drawer or the tray and the table are even more closely allied and indicate a much more routine or more habitual kind of experimental combinatorics, one which would require its own unique furniture 
a table which we might even call an instrument. For it is here, on the desk, on the table, on the shelves, that thinking through matter takes place. Can we imagine a way in which the natural historical material gathered by apothecaries passes through physical manipulations and attendant thought processes similar to those employed in their pharmaceutical practice, including the kinds of relational experiments with matter which consequently produced something like alchemical affinity tables, for example? Can we take the table itself as a physical form on which were laid trays of specimens to arrange and relate it to the graphical synoptic tables and zoological affinity and dichotomy tables that were the eventual classificatory production of the knowledge practices and collection management and manipulation? The modality and the mobility of the trays Whoops. The mortality and mobility of the trays with their grid that both isolates individual specimens from each other and relates them to each other. Their grid at both levels differences and heightens awareness of differences are the perfect complementarity to the linear nature of a catalog which links each specimen to its descriptor by a numerical index. No matter where any element is on the gaming board of the specimen tray or the table upon which it sits, it's always traceable to its textual description in the catalog and to any references which may have been annotated there. I'm attempting to reconstruct here ephemeral and manual practices from a set of rudimentary instruments and furnishings that have become unyoked from that daily practice or indeed of any record of them, save possibly from a certain classificatory outcome. The gaming board and the game pieces on it may be more than just a metaphor here, though reconstructing the rules of such a game is a complex task when one has only the implements to go on. Then there is the way in which these same little drawers and boxes after the serious fun of the experiments and the comparison, are later reused to present, embody, and reinforce classifications that these same boxes have been used hermeneutically to produce, a transposition to fixed representation and display that is almost completely obscuring the earlier experimental use of that very same specimen tray. So if Sloan's management of collections and his practice is in some way a part of the origin of the use of morphological observation as a natural historical tool which eventually led to the idea of speciation and beyond, I would like to end with a coda, a coda which also brings us to the end of morphology. Perhaps not quite the end, but at least the waning of morphology as the operative mode of distinction in natural history. This is the 96 well microplate with an alphanumeric referential grid. It is today as ubiquitous and invisible as was and perhaps even still is the early modern specimen drawer with its own gridded wells. The microplate is literally transparent, made of high optical quality plastic, which it needs to be in order to be scanned and its contents analyzed by mass spectrometers, chromatographic instruments, and more. Because genomics has come to the museum and the world in a box is now truly a microcosm, the world in the box is now in a refrigerator. You will recall the image of a gene sequencer from the NHM near the beginning of my presentation. There is also a correlative molecular collection at the NHM and in many other natural history museums. A biobank that is kept in microplates in cryo-freezers. <laughs> 
part of a worldwide collection called the Frozen Ark. So if we have seen here how collection management process produces knowledge, we have also implicitly seen how new instruments and new practices in turn alter collection management. The advent of the microplate is changing collection management forever. I'm going to show you several slides here from a slide presentation that was created by Dr. Alex Borisenko, who is the collections manager for the Canadian Barcode of Life Systems, uh, Barcode of Life Data Systems Initiative. This vast international project aims to extract DNA from any and every available specimen the world over, creating a short genetic identifier for each. You can see his problem here. The museum collections are heterogeneous and his throughput is standardized. What is of interest here is that the main implications of this project for natural history collections and, their, uh, and the museums that run them is the realignment of collection management along the lines of standardization unique to turn of the century biotechnology. This construction of his analytical pipeline is replacing the specimen tray or drawer with a 96 well plastic plate. So here the, the funnel is in fact only partly metaphoric because liquidization is part of the molecularization of specimens and a requisite of DNA extraction and PCR amplification. Dr. Borisenko's slides were created for the third international conference of the Barcode of Life in Mexico in 2009. And in them, we can follow the 96 well uh, microplate around to see how deeply this major international project is changing collections management practices the world over. For example, here it can be seen as the pivotal uh, component of transforming collection specimens into lab-ready arrays of tissue samples. So what they're doing here is to actually uh, re-array specimens into specimen drawers that have exactly the 96 well specimen drawer that matches the tiny uh, 96 well microplate. This goes as far as the participating museum actually choosing to entirely rearray and redeploy these kinds of smaller specimens into these microplate matching 96 well specimen drawers so that there is less of a chance of a mix up between the large scale body and the molecular specimen which has been extracted from it. So I will end here with a quote from Dr. Borisenko's talk at that same conference in 2009, which gives a sense of how natural history collections of the 21st century not only depend on collections management of the preceding centuries, but mirror them in terms of scale and of ambition. Borisenko said on that day, a core barcoding facility, such as the Canadian Center for DNA Barcoding, operates at the scale of a small sequencing factory. This literally makes it an insatiable consumer of biological materials. No single natural history collection existing today is capable of satisfying these appetites. I quote, despite the vast biodiversity collections holdings, capacity is not quite there to deliver large volumes of samples at a high rate. Therefore, at the Canadian Barcoding Initiative, one of our mission critical tasks is to maintain a constant inflow of specimens at a pace that matches our production needs for the central barcoding hub. That's quite a quote. I feel certain that Sloan, with his extensive epistolary connections, his staff of amanuensi, his specimen drawers, his albums and glazed boxes, all the collectors that he himself collected, would fully understand Borisenko's hunger.
even as Sloane would see that his own collections might in turn be devoured by the future. So as you see in Sciences of the Archive, case histories very quickly become histories of cases. Thank you. <laughs>